object-oriented programming gives you the ability to invent brand new types of objects in your programs. And when we think about the type of an object, we're going to think of that as what we call a class. And we'll look at that very soon. And a class is going to define, well, uh, whenever we have an object that's of this class, it'll have these certain attributes and these capabilities built into it. And this should feel pretty natural. In the real world, we imagine things like, okay, the idea of a pen in the abstract is could be one of any many different pens. There's millions of pens out there in the world. So if you were to try and generalize what is it that makes up the properties of a pen or the attributes of it, you might imagine it's the pen's color, the fineness of the point of the pen, whether or not it's ink based, uh, and so on. So in this video, we're going to take a look at object-oriented programming in Python, which is going to give us a new means of designing our programs different from if we had only functions to structure our programs with. We're going to look at classes and how to define them. And this is the idea of a new type of object that we might be able to have in our programs. And then how do we actually use those classes to create objects and interact with objects that are instances of that class? Let's start by thinking about a simple example, pizza. I've drawn very poorly two pizzas here, right? And you're just going to have to use your imagination. These are very abstract pizzas. What are some of the attributes? If we think about pizzas just in the abstract, imagine we're a pizzeria trying to make it possible to model pizzas in our database. Like what is a customer ordering and how do we calculate the price of a pizza? Well, pizzas are going to have a couple of different attributes, right? What are the attributes that these pizzas share in common that we can think about sort of in the abstract? Well, they both have some size, right? Now their size isn't the same, but if we're thinking about how do we model the idea of a pizza, every pizza is gonna have some size associated with it. And when we're thinking about pricing a pizza, we know that that tends to be sort of the base price of a pizza. We might think about number of toppings, right? And so uh, number of toppings, and let's say this is size, um, large and size small, right? And maybe we use sizes that are strings. If we're thinking about a pizza in that way, you could also imagine using uh, the diameter in an exact measurement. We'll just use strings. Um, and we can think about the number of toppings. That might be an integer. So this might be, you know, uh, red peppers, green peppers, and mushrooms. So three toppings here. And this one had zero toppings, right? And if we were to think about extra cheese, let's imagine this is no extra cheese. And I'll just, uh, yeah, write extra cheese here. And the extra shaded in, very poor. This is why I program and I'm not an artist. Uh, we'll imagine this pizza does have extra cheese. So this would be extra cheese. And maybe if we're thinking about something that's either a yes, no, uh, in programming, we like to use Booleans. So this would be uh, true and extra cheese false. All right. So we're getting the sense that, okay, um, here we have two different instances of a pizza, but notice they have similar attributes. And maybe we have the ability to calculate the price of these pizzas and we would be able to calculate the price of either pizza. So if we're thinking about, okay, uh, there's clearly differences between these two instances of the idea of a pizza, but they share things in common. And those things that they share in common are what we think of uh, as something that every pizza in our restaurant is going to have to sort of describe what it's made up of. So if we're thinking about what those things were, we, we, we already decided, you know, one of them was the size, another was the number of toppings, and the last was, you know, whether or not it had extra cheese. The size was a string, the number of toppings was an integer, and extra cheese was a Boolean. So how can we take this intuition and try and model the idea of a pizza in the abstract in our programs, and then maybe go and actually construct um, instances of that pizza in memory that would capture this data? So let's jump into an example in VS Code. And I'm going to start, uh, I'm just going to use a lessons directory and set up a new file for um, classes and objects.py, all right? And in this example, I'm just gonna go ahead and set up a doc string that, that says, okay, uh, this is example uh, of a class and objects instantiation. 
That's a fancy word. Instantiation, we'll talk about what that means, but it's the idea of taking, okay, we've got the idea of a pizza, now how do we actually have a real actual pizza modeled in our program? All right. To work with a new type of data, to introduce a new kind of object into our program without actually having actual objects of that kind, we're going to use the class we, keyword to say we're, we're, we're inventing the class pizza here. And notice that I'm naming this class with a capital P. This is a convention. This name is an identifier, just like the name of a function or the name of a variable. But one of the ways that is conventionally uh, uh, obvious in terms of what, it, what is this identifier you're looking at, if you see a capital first letter to it, you know that you're, you're probably looking at the name of a class and that will become important uh, soon. But you could name classes with under all lowercase letters. We would encourage you uh, not to because that doesn't really follow the, the style conventions of this programming language, nor most others. Our classes can have doc strings. Um, and so let's say the uh, pizza is, models the idea of a pizza. Right? And I should also mention that the keyword class is a reserved word in Python, just like death when we're defining a function. So this is a different kind of um, construct that we're setting up here. We're, we're defining the idea of a pizza right now. Uh, and we won't have any pizzas yet. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, set up the attributes. So I'm going to make a little comment here. And the first attribute of a pizza is the size. And we said that would be a string. All right. The second attribute that we looked at was toppings. And um, for now, let's just make this an, in, an integer. You can imagine this being a list of strings if we wanted to keep track of the actual toppings. And there are other ways that you can imagine modeling a pizza. And when we're talking about design and object-oriented programming, this is kind of what we mean. We're, we're trying to, when you're designing new data types in your programs, you're having to decide what are the important attributes that you care about. Of course, there's tons of other attributes that might exist in a pizza, like what flour did you use? Uh, what is the oven temperature when you're baking it? What kind of oven are you using? There are different ways of thinking about a pizza in much more nuanced levels. We're picking a very high level, simple representation here. Uh, and extra cheese was the last attribute that we're talking about. That's a Boolean, okay? All of these attributes are indented, um, notice. And uh, that is just like the convention in Python that we're, we're using white space to signify, okay, these are attributes of the class pizza. Well, this says, okay, now that we've defined the idea of a pizza, we don't actually have any pizzas in our program yet. How can we set up a pizza? Well, let's set up the first pizza. Um, and uh, maybe I'll name this uh, a pizza. And its type will be pizza, right? And it will construct, will construct a new pizza object, right? So right out of the gates here, you're seeing something interesting and very exciting. Notice here that when we typed this variable, it's a type that we just invented. The, the type pizza doesn't exist in the Python standard library. We just came up with this on our own. We've invented a brand new type. And types, as you know, are very important in programming because they signal to us what is it that this variable is trying to represent, what are its attributes, and what are its capabilities. This call to a function here is interesting because it looks like a function call, right? This, this feels no different than a function call. But notice that what pizza is is it's actually a class. So this is a special kind of function call called a constructor call. And we'll talk about that in more depth soon. Before we do that, let's go ahead and just um, set up some of, uh, add some of these attribute values to uh, our pizza. So a pizza dot size is assigned large. And a pizza dot toppings is assigned three. And a pizza dot extra cheese is assigned Faults, right? And so if we go back to this, this pizza that we started with, we're, we're trying to represent this pizza here. 
you'll notice right out of the gates that when we th talk about, you know, we've got an object here and we'll see in, in memory that a pizza is referring to an actual pizza object that uh, <clears throat> you've got to use your imagine, like we, you've got to use your imagination. Uh, the, like all this object really is, is three variables closely related together and bundled together in a single object. Right. And so we don't actually have a pizza. We don't have anything that looks like a pizza not even anything that's as bad looking as the pizza, you know, I drew, uh, we're just bundling variables together and we're using that to model and represent the idea of a pizza in our program because we'd like to be able to calculate its price. Okay. So I'm going to save this program and, um, just to sort of give you a sense of right now, uh, we can, we can try doing some things that, that, that are going to feel a little bit weird, but what, what happens when we print a pizza? And what happens when we print, say, a pizza dot size? Okay. So we've got a very simple little program here. And I'm just going to go ahead and try running this program in my terminal to convince you uh, that this will actually be a valid program. And it works somewhat as we expect. Right? So, Let's try running python-m, and then I'm in the lessons directory, and classes objects is the name of my script. Okay, we get two lines of output. We see that there's this first line of output that looks kind of scary and intimidating and doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then hopefully we see the second line is what we expect. So the size of a pizza was large. I'm not going to break down exactly what's going on in this first line, but I want to point out just a couple of things. And actually, I'm going to print one other thing here. Right? So let's print pizza. Right? So notice when we print pizza on this first line 17, we're printing you know, pizza, the class, the idea of the pizza. So I'm going to try running this one more time. Okay, so notice that when we print pizza, we have a class whose name is pizza. And because we are running this particular Python script as a module, that's what this dash M signifies. We know that the name of this module is double underscore main. And so we're saying in the main module that we're running and evaluating right now, we have something named pizza and it's a class. When we print out a pizza, notice that it's an object. And it's specifically a pizza object. Like its type is the type that's defined in the main module and it's named pizza. And then this weird looking string of characters here, turns out that's a memory address in our heap. And we can imagine what that means in just a moment, All right? So the, well, we'll learn later how to make this a much nicer string representation of our pizza. We'd really like for this to be less, um, scary looking than, you know, pizza object at OXOO, like blah, blah, blah. We'll come back to that. Um, but for now, let's take a look at what is going on in memory when this program is evaluated, at least at a high level. So I'm going to set up a quick memory diagram here. And this memory diagram is, of course, going to have a stack. And it's going to have a globals frame. And we're also going to have a heap. And when we encounter a class, it's just like encountering a function in the sense that we're not really going to do anything with it other than record that it exists. Okay. So here we're going to have in our globals frame, okay, we've encountered the definition of a pizza. So we're saying that pizza is bound to this class definition that exists on lines four through 10. Okay. Now what else? Well, uh, once we're done with that, when we reach line 13, we see that we're calling a function. It looks like a function call, right? Here's why we keep track of functions and classes in our memory diagrams. When we look at, you know, okay, well, what is pizza? Oh, it's not actually a function, it's a class. Well, when you call a class, something special happens. We construct a new object of that class's type, right? 
So the way that we can imagine visualizing this in our diagram is saying, okay, we're gonna have a new pizza object. And it's gonna have these three attributes associated with it. Size, toppings, and extra cheese. All right. So we've got this pizza object Actually, let me give myself a little bit more space on this side. And we're binding the name a pizza, a variable, to this object. So you're already picking up on something else that's important and uh, necessary to recognize that when we construct objects, we're working with references, just like when you're using lists and dictionaries, objects are reference types, such that whenever you assign a variable to an object, that uh, variable is actually given a reference to that object that lives in the heap, all right? Next, we see our attributes being set. So a pizza.size is large. Whenever you see this dot operator, what I want you to recognize is that the dot is saying, follow the, the arrow. So a pizza, and then dot is saying, okay, follow this reference and go look at what it refers to. And then size is going to be large. Okay. Similarly, a pizza dot toppings is assigned three, initializes three to that attribute. And a pizza dot extra cheese is false, would initialize this to false. Okay, great. So now we have these attributes set up in our pizza object. And the output that we saw, you know, uh, if I were to bring that back for just a moment, was when we printed pizza. We said, okay, well, what is pizza? Well, it's a class. And the way that Python is representing that as a string is saying class main.pizza, right? When we printed a pizza, a pizza is actually a pizza object. Right? So notice that it, the type that we're giving is named pizza here. Uh, and it has toppings three, size large, and extra cheese false. We can access the attributes of a pizza or uh, any attribute in an object by giving the, a variable name or any reference to uh, an object, followed by a dot, and then the attribute name. So a pizza dot size, and that's what led to large being printed out here. So hopefully no surprises so far. Now, what if we wanted to write a function that could compute the size or the, the price of this pizza with some, some simple heuristics? How might we write a function that involves um, uh, a pizza? So let's go ahead and um, I'm gonna define this first outside of the class pizza, and then we'll come back and look at um, how we can actually define this as a special kind of function inside the idea of a pizza so that we have so that every pizza can calculate its own price. So let's define a function and named price. And what do we want to give it as um, an argument? Or how do we want to name our parameter? We want to name this parameter, let's say, um, uh, pizza, pizza. Right. And what's this going to return to us? It's going to return to us a float, which is the price. And we're going to say calculate price of a pizza. Okay. So let's imagine maybe that let's simplify our assumptions here. And, uh, and let's go ahead and set up a skeleton function and say that, okay, we've got a um, total is going to be a float and it's initially 0, 0.0. And ultimately we're going to return the total. Right? And we still have more work to do. So I'm just going to enter a comment that says to do compute price. Right? But before we get into the simple little algorithm for computing the price of a pizza, let me just pause and talk about what's going on with this parameter because it's interesting. Right? Remember that our programming languages are case sensitive. So the class pizza we see is being used as a type. So we're saying the type of this first parameter is the class pizza. So you've got to give me something, you got to give me a pizza object in order to call this function. And we're naming this parameter pizza, lowercase, and that 
gives us the sense that, okay, yeah, we've got a, a variable name or a parameter named pizza, lowercase, whose type is pizza, uppercase. Right? Being able to differentiate those two ideas is important. Uh, remember, the name of a parameter only matters inside of a function, so we could name this, you know, any pizza or some pizza or whatever you want, right? So now that we have this function definition, how might we actually um, uh, calculate the price of the pizza? Well, let's say that uh, if the pizza.size is equal to, say, uh, large, the total will be um, increased by, say, $10, right? Else, total will be increased by, say, $8, okay? This is a weird pizza shop that only has two sizes of pizza, large or small, all right? Uh, maybe our toppings are 75 cents a piece. Right, so we can say, you know, total is increased by the number of toppings multiplied by 75 cents. And maybe um, if there's extra cheese, so if pizza dot extra cheese, which is a Boolean attribute, if that Boolean attribute is true, then this if statement will evaluate to true and we would go into this if statement. Maybe we add a dollar to our pizza price, right? Very simple little algorithm for defining uh, a pizza, okay? Uh, so how would we actually make use of this function? Well, I'm going to, uh, if you need a little bit of extra time to, to continue working with this function, pause the video here. Otherwise, I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom here and print uh, an F string, which is price, and then the price will be, um, price of a pizza, right? And let's try running this program. And we see that the price of this pizza that we designed at this pizza shop is 12.25, which is a solid deal for a large pizza, right? Um, so what happened when we called this function? Well, we passed a reference to from a pizza. So a pizza, remember if I open up my diagram, a pizza was bound to this pizza object. So when we set up the frame for calling this price function, in it, the parameter pizza would also be a reference to this pizza object, right? Uh, and, and we could briefly, uh, just very briefly imagine this really quickly. We're not gonna trace through this whole thing, um, but imagine we're trying to evaluate this call right here. Uh, we'd have a price function, or sorry, a price frame, and it would be on line 36 that we called that, and we would be setting up, remember we named that parameter pizza, and it would be bound to the same object that a pizza was in globals, all right? And so then that ran through these steps up here, and we ultimately returned, you know, 1225, I think, I can't actually remember, maybe it was 1275, uh, was what, what happened after evaluating these steps, and there was a a total variable set up in there. I'm not gonna jump through all those steps right now uh, because I wanna focus more on object-oriented programming, right? But the important part here is notice something very cool that's different from what we were doing before. Previously, if you wanted to define a function that could calculate the price of a pizza and the way you were modeling a pizza was with three different attributes, the size, the number of toppings, and extra cheese, you would have needed to declare all three of those parameters as separate parameters, right? And then when you called that pizza, you know, you would have been passing in like price, you know, large, three, and true or something. And it's a little bit arbitrary. What are these, what is large, three, and true? And given this example, you know what it is. But as someone looking at a program for the first time, it might not make sense what each of those, what, what does that three mean, right? But with object-oriented programming, we're able to define the new idea here, the idea of a pizza. And every pizza is going to have these three attributes bundled with it. So we can define functions that, hey, you give me this object, and I know that object is going to have these three attributes. And those three attributes can be different types. They could be the same type, too. We could have two string uh, attributes or multiple int attributes. You can have as many attributes in a class as you'd like, and those attributes can be whatever type they need to be. 
right? So it gives us the ability to bundle related variables together and treat them as one coherent unit that we can pass around to other places in our programs. Now, I mentioned that when we introduce new types, types have not only attributes, but also capabilities. Right now, our pizza object doesn't have any capabilities. But what if we wanted to make it possible to calculate the price of a pizza by adding that capability to the pizza object or to every pizza object? And this is kind of a funny thing. And this is where the sort of some of the analogies of what's in the real world will break down. We can define a pizza class such that its objects can calculate their own price. This is different from the real world, right? You can't ask a pizza, what is your price? <laughs> uh, it won't tell you. The price is computed by something else. So we could model this in various ways. Um, but I want to show you how, let's imagine we're living in a world where we want to be able to ask a pizza, what is its price? Um, and define what's called a method on that pizza. So we've already defined this function. And functions and methods are very closely related to one another. In fact, you can think of a function as a very, sorry, as a method as a very special kind of function that is defined in the context of a class and related to its objects, right? And this is where we're going to see the difference between object-oriented programming and more functional or procedural programming, right? So here we wrote a pizza price function and we called price of a pizza. Now we're going to add, like define this as a method instead. Okay. So let's try if you select all of this text for price and uh, you press tab, you'll indent it once. You'll notice that we have an error. And if we look at this error, it's kind of a funny one. Right? It says instance, me instance methods should take a self. So when we think about what is an instance method, uh, I'll come back to this terminology, but it's it's what we're trying to define here. It's a function that our pizza objects are going to have defined on them, right? So this first parameter is going to be a special one, right? And it's going to be self, right? And we'll come back and we'll talk about this in just a moment, right? Additionally, rather than saying if pizza.size and pizza.toppings, we'll see self.toppings if self.extra cheese, okay? So everywhere we had the word pizza, we're replacing that parameter with a special parameter named self, okay? And I'm doing this within the context. I'm gonna make this a little bit smaller once more so this all fits. And I'm, there we go, of the pizza class, right? So now what we're saying is the idea of a pizza in this program is that we have three attributes and it has the capability to calculate its own price, right? And so here we're, we're already seeing that, again, we're not trying to model the real world and it, like a pizza can't calculate its own price, but our pizzas are going to be able to calculate their own price because we're living in programmer's fantasy land here, right? Um, the key idea that we're seeing is that we can define functionality and add capabilities to the data types in our programs. Okay, so now that we've defined this method, of pizza, notice that it's indented such that it all belongs to the pizza class. What happens down below? Well, you'll notice that you now have an error here. We don't have a function named price defined anymore. So how do we actually calculate the price of a pizza? Well, a pizza dot and then price, okay? So notice dot price looks like a function call there's something funny going on here, right? There's something, why is it that we have no arguments to this method call, but there's this parameter self here. There must be a relationship between these two things. Let me see if I can fit all of this on the screen. Great. So I'm going to actually uh, clear, now I'm gonna leave what we've got here because we'll continue this example. Okay. So what changes about our diagram when we add a method to a class? Well, the class definition is now much different, right? So now the class is defined on, from lines four to uh, the last line is line 25, right? 
we're not going to model or we're not going to worry about representing methods in our classes. Right? We'll come back and talk about how we can look this up in just a moment. The key question now becomes what happens when we encounter a call that looks like this? A pizza dot price. This is a method call, right? So this is important terminology to get comfortable with. And you can determine a method call by seeing uh, the dot operator and then what looks like a function call just following it. You've actually used some methods before. When you had a list, you used list the list name dot append, and that was a method call. Dot pop was also a method call. Uh, and so this isn't a new concept entirely, but what's new is how to, we're now seeing how we can define our own classes which have methods associated with them. And the method here is price. So what we're going to do is how, now the question becomes, how do we set up a method call and how do we know if we have a valid method call? Let's talk about how we can determine whether or not this is valid first. So if we look at what is a pizza and a pizza is a something that's of type pizza. Let me change to blue here, right? So a pizza, we look at our current frame and we see, okay, we do have a pizza. What is the type of this? Well, we know its type is pizza. Okay. And then when we see, okay, a method call, well, we need to go look at it, the type, the class definition and see, is there a method that is named price defined, right? Yes. So this method does exist. And we would need to check, do the arguments correspond to the parameters? And here's where things are a little bit different from a function call. This self parameter, you can ignore in this step, right? So because there's no arguments here and no other parameters, this checks out. Self is a parameter that Python is gonna establish on our behalf automatically for us when the frame for this function is established on the stack. And we'll see that in just a moment. We would also wanna check how is this being used? Well, this is returning a float and we're just printing that out. So the return types check out too. So this is a valid method call, okay? So let's set up a frame for this method. We're setting up a frame for this price method. And remember price is a method that's defined within the pizza class. Right, so pizza and then price is uh, the, func the method within it. So when we label our frames, I'm going to encourage you to use a convention that's pretty common throughout many programming languages, which is the name of the class, followed by a hash symbol, and then the name of the method, so price, All right? And this call occurred on line 35, so my return address is line 35 and we need to establish our parameters. Well, there's only one in itself, all right? And what does self refer to? Well, here's where things are really cool and why we think of this as being called object-oriented. Notice that we have an object, a pizza, and we're calling a method on it. Well, what that means is the self parameter is automatically going to be established as a reference to whatever object we call that method on. So a pizza was this particular pizza. So when we think about how do we set up the self parameter, well, it's gonna be, it's gonna refer to that exact same pizza object. And that's pretty cool. So then we would jump in and this function would otherwise work exactly the same. The key difference when setting up a method call versus a function is we have to have some object that we're calling this method on. And we need to be sure that that object its type in this case is a pizza, but you could also imagine maybe we've got a, another type of object, um, which is pasta and pasta as a class might also have a price method. So when we set up a frame for calling a method, we have to record the class name as well as the method name. And typically we'll just put a hash symbol between them and say, okay, this is the price method of the pizza class if we had a class pasta and it also had a method price, we would say, and we called, you know, what is the price of some pasta? We would set up our frame such that we were looking at the pasta price method, right? And so this is kind of cool. We can say that, oh, multiple objects and types of objects in our program can have similar methods, the ability to calculate their price. And that's, that's kind of nice, okay? Uh, and I'm not gonna continue on, but everything would be the same here within this frame. We would have a total, 
you know, it would be initially zero, we would go through and calculate it, so on and so forth, right? Just like a regular function call. And when this returns, you know, let's say the return value is 12.0, whatever it was, uh, we would return back to the frame we came from, this would evaluate to that return value, just the same as it would any other way, right? So that's pretty cool. We can define some uh, new capabilities. Now I mentioned that this is where the name object oriented comes from. So compare this line of code, a pizza.price with what we had before, price of a pizza, right? So if we compare these, notice that in the object oriented example, what we're seeing is the object comes first. We're addressing some object. We're actually saying, hey, a pizza, I want you to calculate your price and I wanna call your price function, which is technically a method. I wanna call your price method, right? As opposed to what we think of as more a more functional approach, where we're saying, okay, let's define a price function and we're gonna give it a pizza. And so we would think of this as functional style programming because the function is specified first and then we're giving it some information. Whereas with object-oriented programming, we're typically saying, okay, here's an object, now let's do something with that object. Let's, let's uh, call its price method. Similarly, we've got this object and we're asking for its size attribute, okay? Cool. Our methods can also have other attributes, right? Um, so let's maybe add, or sorry, extra parameters. Let's add one more parameter here, which is say tax. And yeah, it's also a float, right? And um, tax is going to be added at the very end. So total is um, actually is gonna be uh, multiplied by tax, right? So uh, if we wanted to use a tax, so notice we declared an extra, our first parameter besides the self keyword. That means that our method call is now invalid. So the price needs a tax argument, right? It says argument is missing for tax. Um, so let's give it, you know, let's say um, one point, I don't know, 5% tax, right? Uh, and so we're saying, because we're using the relative reassignment operator that's multiplication, we're gonna take total, multiply it by 1.05, and that's gonna add tax to it, right? So it's possible for methods to have arguments if those methods declare extra parameters. Other than the self parameter, everything else works the same. The self parameter is important though, and it must come first when you're defining your parameters when declaring a method. And remember, self is automatically established to be a reference to the object the method was called on. So here, it was a reference to whatever a pizza was, which was this pizza object. Okay, now what I'd like to do is um, make it a little bit easier to construct a new pizza. Right? So notice that here, we, uh, we set up all of the attributes after constructing the pizza. But what if we wanted this to all be possible in one step? We wanted to say, I'm, you know, give me a new pizza object where the size is initially large, the toppings are three, and the extra cheese is false. Or maybe more specifically, you know, we wanted to also be able to make and represent the second smaller pizza that we talked about earlier. We've seen a method that we can call once we have an object. Well, there's a special method that we can define that is actually called a constructor. And that constructor will be called as soon as we construct a new object that allows us to, and its purpose is that it makes it easier for us to establish initial values for our attributes and to make our object such that it's ready to go. Okay. Before I do this, I wanna mention one other thing that's sort of what we think of as sort of a poor man's construction, um, which is we can specify some default attribute values. So we could say that the default size of a pizza is small, the default number of toppings is say zero, and the default for extra cheese is false, right? And if I were to do this, when I constructed a new pizza object, the size would initially be small, the toppings zero, and extra cheese false. So I'm gonna, let's go ahead and set up um, another pizza down below. And it's also gonna be of type pizza and it's gonna be construct a new pizza object and let's print 
a pizza that size, right? So because of what we've got going on up here, um, because of these default attribute values, when we reach line 39, what would happen in memory is we would have another pizza and it would be bound to a separate pizza object. So notice we can have multiple pizza objects even though we have one pizza class and its size would initially be small. Get out of the way here, small and its toppings zero and its extra cheese i'm just going to shorthand that extra cheese would be false all right so when we set up the second pizza object notice that we have two pizza objects in memory and they have different attributes uh, they have different attribute values, even though they have the same set of attributes associated with them. So every pizza has size, toppings, and extra cheese, but each individual pizza object can have whatever values it wants for those, as long as they're the correct types. And by defining these attributes, we set up these uh, attributes when we construct a new object automatically by default. Right? So if we knew that we always wanted to start our pizzas off as small zero toppings and no extra cheese, we could do it like this. Right. Well, what if we wanted to make it possible to construct a pizza where these three values were associated with um, these attributes as soon as that pizza was constructed? And here's where the special concept of a constructor comes into play. It's a special kind of method. So it's going to look a lot like the price method, but be named differently. Right, so def double underscore init and self. And we're not going to specify a return type. We'll come back to why we don't specify a return type soon. It's a special kind of method. Here, what we'd like to be able to do is say, OK, um, I want to be able to give this constructor function call. Right, So this method the special method, and we know that it's special because of the double underscores. This is a special name that Python has set up, saying, hey, we as the programming language have decided this has meaning uh, unique to it. This method is going to automatically be called whenever we construct a new pizza object, right? So whenever we say pizza, the class name, followed by what looks like a function call, if that class defines a constructor, which this is, uh, then this will get called. And we'd like to be able to give the uh, three parameters to this. We'd like to be able to give the size, stir, and the, let's actually write these out. So size is string, toppings is int, and extra cheese is a Boolean, right? And what do we want to do with these parameters? Well, we want to initialize each of our attributes. So size self.size is assigned the size parameter. Self.toppings is assigned the toppings parameter. And self.extra cheese, the attribute is assigned the extra cheese parameter. Okay. And let's go ahead and actually give this um, a doc string. So the point of a constructor is to initialize the attributes of an object. Once we define this, we actually don't have any use for these default attribute values because they're always going to be set in our constructor. Um, you know what, maybe, um, maybe let's actually leave extra cheese as false and we're not going to make this part of the constructor. And I'll talk about this in just a moment. So I'm, I'm actually going to modify here and say that our constructor is going to take two parameters, the size and the number of toppings. And by default, the extra cheese attribute is just going to be false. And if we want to customize that later, we can, but it's not going to be part of the construction of uh, a pizza object. So what does this mean? This, this probably looks kind of confusing. It's strange that there's no return type or return statement here. 
All right, well, let's actually uh, jump into why that is and what's going on. Before we can actually run our program, you'll notice that we've created an error. And it says arguments are missing for size and number of toppings. Okay, so remember, this is a special, con this is a special method that when we define it, it changes the way we are defining our constructor call. So even though this is named init, this is the method that's going to be called, or the constructor more specifically, when we call a function that's the name of that class that it's defined on. So here, the name of the class is pizza. We're calling the pizza class constructor. So Python is automatically calling this init function. And notice that init is short for initialization, initialization of the object. So we need to give it the two, and the two parameters that are missing are the size and the toppings. So the size of this first pizza was large, and the number of toppings was three, right? So I can now remove those next two lines, and I don't even need this extra cheese false line, right? For another pizza, we also need to change the way we're constructing it so that it's valid. Um, pizza constructed with size small, zero toppings, and if we're thinking about the original example that motivated this, the extra cheese was true. Okay. Cool. So notice that this is much easier. So we now changed what took three lines into a single line because when we initialized the pizza object, we could say right out of the gates, hey, this pizza is going to be large and it's going to have three toppings. Similarly, we said this pizza is going to be small, zero toppings, and we want to uh, change the extra cheese attribute. So I could run this program one more time and the lines that we're going to be looking for are changing, you know, maybe I'll calculate the price of, of this piece as well. So print F string price of the small pizza is a pizza dot price also with a tax of 5%, right? Oops. And I want to print another pizza dot price. Oh, and I meant to print another pizza dot size here. Right. So, uh, and then missing a curly brace. Great. Um, this size, uh, I had accidentally written a pizza dot size. It should have been another pizza dot size, and we'll expect that to be small. Uh, and notice that we're referring to a different variable that refers to a different object than a pizza. Okay. So I'm going to clear this output and I'm going to try running this program one more time. And then we'll think about the memory implications and we'll be done. All right. So uh, notice a pizza dot size is large. Another pizza dot size is small. Their prices are different. So even though we called the same method with the same arguments, because we called this method on different objects, we got different results. And that's kind of cool, right? We're asking a pizza, what's your price? And asking another pizza, what's your price? And we get back different results because those pizzas have different attributes associated with them. Okay. So I want to actually uh, step through this first constructor and then we'll, we'll call this uh, a completed example. Oops. All right. So in order to imagine this first constructor call and think about how we would represent it in memory, I'm going to have to unwind some of my drawing here and some of this diagram. Okay. What we're imagining here is we've just reached line 35. And actually before, I'll, I'll, let's restart this from, from scratch here. So we've just finished processing this class definition. The class is now uh, defined on lines four through 32. And then we reach line 35. And that's what we're focused on in this quick example, right? What happens here? Well, we reach a constructor call. How do we know this is a constructor call? Well, it looks like a function call. But when we look at what is pizza actually, it's a class definition. And whenever you see a function call to a class, it means you're calling, you're constructing a new object. And so the first thing that you can always do, no matter uh, what you're working with when you're in this position, is you can go ahead and set up a pizza object and its attributes. So its attributes were toppings, oops, size, toppings, and extra cheese. Okay. 
and extra cheese had a default value of false, right? So extra cheese, we said we left that as false. We left those other two attributes uninitialized here. And that's because we are going to initialize them in this constructor. Now here's where things are different than what we saw before. When you reach a call to a constructor that when you look at the class and you see, oh, there's an init method defined or an init constructor more specifically defined, we need to go process this constructor call. So we're gonna add a frame and the frame will be pizza and init. Okay. This first parameter self is going to establish, it's, it's gonna be established to a reference that refers to this object that we're initializing, right? And so this is pretty cool. When you call this pizza constructor behind the scenes, Python first is setting up this pizza object in memory, and then it's giving self a reference to that object. And then we have, you know, the argument large is gonna to correspond to the parameter size. So size is large. And three is the number of toppings. Right. And the return address of this call uh, was line 35. Great. So we've set all this up, we're ready to jump in. And I'm gonna process the jumping in in blue. Right. So here we, we see this line, it's an assignment statement. Self.size is assigned size. Well, what is size? We look in our current frame and we say, okay, size is large. It's the string that we passed in. And we're assigning that to self.size. Well, self dot, we follow the arrow size is going to be large. Great. And now we see uh, toppings, which is this attribute or this uh, argument three is assigned, which was assigned to the toppings parameter. So toppings, we look in our current frame, that's three. Self.toppings is also three, right? Now here's where something really interesting happens. Constructors are special, right? Notice there's nothing here. Just like with functions that return none, there's no return statement that's needed in a constructor call or in a constructor definition. However, what we will see is that there is an implicit return statement here. Every constructor you should imagine has an implicit return statement that says return self. So what is self? Well, self is this reference. So what we're going to return from a constructor call is that reference, right? And so where are we returning this to? We're returning it to line 35. And this was the constructor call that we're returning. It resulted in a reference to this pizza object. And so ultimately a pizza is also going to refer to that object. And notice that the purpose of this constructor was it allowed us to initialize the attributes of this object that we cared about, right? We cared about the toppings attribute and the size attribute. We could pass both of those in as arguments to our constructor. And then the constructor was responsible for initializing those values. And so now every time we construct a pizza in one function call, we can establish those two attributes. And if we wanted to customize the pizza further by adding, saying, you know, extra cheese is true, you can still go change those attributes later. I'm not gonna diagram the rest of this. I think we've uh, reached a good stopping point. So this was an introduction to the idea of object-oriented programming. And there are a few concepts we should just go over as a review of what you've seen. When defining a class, you're introducing a brand new data type. It allows you to create new kinds of objects in your programs. Here we define the idea of a pizza. And we said that every pizza, whenever we get later on to the point of actually constructing pizza objects in our program, all pizza objects are gonna have a size, number of toppings, and uh, extra cheese. Notice these are different types. So as opposed to say a dictionary where your keys have to be one type and your values have to be another, Notice that we can specifically type, you know, size is one thing, toppings is another, and we can be a little bit more specific and concrete about what all of the, these attributes of our pizza object actually are. We then looked at the ability to define methods. Methods give our objects capabilities. Now that we've defined a price method on the idea of a pizza, every pizza object that we construct has the ability to price to calculate its price built into it. 
this is where we kind of see that you know we can model ideas in programs that don't necessarily map exactly to objects in the real world right and that's okay we're not trying to necessarily say everything should be modeled exactly the same uh, sometimes it depends on how you want to design your program and here we're imagining we're a pizzeria we'd like to be able to quickly you know model the idea of a pizza and ask it for what what its price is and so we've done that here lastly we saw a special kind of method a constructor and it's so special that you're not even going to hear me call this a method in the future even though technically it's it is a special little method and you can see that it looks a lot like one um, but a constructor is very special and you'll see them a lot they're special because whenever you go to construct a new object you want all of that object's attributes to be initialized right and so it becomes really tedious if you don't have con custom constructors that allow you to say, okay, I want to set up my pizza with this specific size and toppings. If you later had to say what we started out with, right, where a pizza dot size is, you know, large and having to say, you know, each of your attributes one by one by one with a constructor, we can set those attributes up as part of the process of initialization of that object. Once we've defined a class, we can construct multiple instances. So here we've got two pizza objects in memory. We could have three, four, hundreds, millions. And each of those objects has the attributes that were specified in the class, right? Each pizza now has a size, number of toppings, and whether or not it has extra cheese. But each pizza can have different values for those attributes. All of these pizzas have the ability to calculate a price built into it. And we could define other methods, such as maybe bake, I don't know what that would mean in this model, but you know, maybe we want to make it possible to bake a pizza. Um, maybe we want to calculate the calories of a pizza based on some rough heuristics, kind of like we did price. We could, we could build in the, the caloric value of, of a pizza, things like that. We'll get additional practice looking at classes and objects because we can start to model very different things. When you think about you know, your social media profile on say Twitter or Instagram, uh, you're going to have like a screen name, that's going to be a string. You're going to have a bio, that's also a string. Number of followers is some integer, a list of people following you. And I should mention that these attributes could be, you know, lists and dictionaries as well. And we'll see in the future that they can actually be other types of objects too. We could have a pizza uh, that has, you know, uh, um, toppings where our topping is a class that's special and has its own characteristics so that each topping might have its a separate price. We could have some premium toppings and some, uh, some regular toppings. So we're starting to develop a richer vocabulary in our programs that allow us to model pro problems in a more sophisticated way than we could before. And this is what object-oriented programming is all about. It's used in simulations. It's used in scientific programming. It's used in games. When you're building apps and you think about the buttons and the text areas and I think in the pictures, those are all objects behind the scenes. Uh, Object-oriented programming is used all over the place and is a very powerful evolution of the paradigm that we were coming from, which is a more functional style uh, and great work with object-oriented programming today.